Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to the Board of Education Budget Workshop and regular business meeting, March 21st. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Moving quickly into board business, we have the treasurer's report for January 2019. Brian will walk us through that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, two things to notice that came in in the month of January. Our star reimbursement from the state, you notice on the first page, uh, we, we received that uh, for the month of January. And then on the last page, just to point out, you'll see fewer uh, accounts that the district has. We cleaned up and close some accounts that we weren't really using, and you'll see uh, the higher uh, interest rates on some of our investments uh, for the month of January. So really excited about our investment strategy moving forward um, to see if we can drive some, uh, some extra funds for the district. Thank you, and with that said, can we have a motion please to accept the treasurer's report? Hello. So moved by Dave, second. second. By Sue, all in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Before we continue, I'd just like to give a tiny shout out to our Wendy. I read over the past few days. Our two student authors, Catherine Ryder and Emerson Ormond. This is an incredible book. It, it captures the spirit of Peter Pan and moves it into the lives of kids in other difficult circumstances. But it's extremely well done. I highly recommend it. And with that said, moving on to opening comments, Linda right. will share with us. All right. Um, the development of an operating budget is an arduous process. It requires data collection and ana analysis, communication, collaboration, and a strong understanding of the goals and objectives of a strategic plan. There are also assumptions, historical analysis, and forecasting. Understanding all this, the leadership team in this district engages in a collaborative budget process that encourages input from all stakeholders. Budget priorities are determined by reviewing all requests and their alignments to the district's priorities and needs. Our budget, budget workshops help to bring all of this work together. Tonight we will learn more about areas of instructional, including curriculum, special education, building budgets, pupil personnel, and instructional technology. We will also hear in the areas of athletics and co-curricular and community education. We'll have an update on the state aid as the Senate and assemblies have both released their budgets and we will see how favorable each is for Webster. With that being said, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, good evening, welcome to our second workshop uh, for this 1920 budget season. Uh, we're going to be focusing on all things instructional this evening. So to start it off, let's look at what we're going to be doing. State aid budget updates. Uh, just going to do a quick uh, update where the state is as far as the Assembly and the Senate and what's going to happen between now when we meet tonight and when we meet in April. Um, and hopefully we have an on-time state budget. And then our instructional areas uh, and then summary questions, where we're headed, um, some of the important dates that are on the horizon. So a couple things that are going on. Tax cap assembly leaves out making it permanent. Uh, Senate is making it tax cap permanent. And I think really from uh, the district's perspective, we've all adjusted in New York State to the tax cap as a district. Um, I think we could live with it. Uh, we've grown accustomed to it over almost seven, eight years now. Uh, but I think there's a few tweaks to the formula that we'd like to see happen, namely around BOCES uh, capital projects being exempted, as well as some of the changes in how pilot growth is calculated. So we'd like to see some changes there. Uh, foundation aid, uh, huge differences proposed by the Assembly and Senate um, compared to the executive budget. Uh, Assembly has 13 new tiers, uh, have no idea where those are gonna land us. Uh, Senate was a little bit more uh, straightforward with an extra 1.2 billion uh, going into foundation aid with a three-year phase-in. 
Both, though, have a full phase-in starting in 2020-21. So remember, we're about $6.4 million away from full phase-in. So, you know, depending on how that shakes out, would that be in three to four years that we would see uh, that additional funding going forward? Uh, building aid, they both uh, reject the governor's proposal of the, what would be about a 10% reduction for us and changes there. Uh, they, they're both rejecting uh, the consolidation of those expense bases that we've talked about into um, what they call a services aid. So that would be a win for us as well if we can keep those expense-based reimbursements coming. Uh, state aid recoveries, quick question. Can anyone here name how much the state owes us in back state aid payments? Eighty-seven thousand dollars. Eighty. Million. Oh, eight million. Yeah. Not eight million. No. You're right with the eight. Eight. Eight hundred sixty thousand. I just saw it. Close. Per eight hundred and forty-five thousand dollars in back state aid payments. And now, and a lot of that, uh, the state owes us from old capital projects. Mm -hmm when they reconcile three to five year lag on some of those things, they'll say, oh, we owe you this, uh, thank you, we'll put you at the end of the line and we'll pay it when you get it. Mm -hmm. So one of the kind of, you know, weird little things that the state does is sometimes on the same day, we'll get a letter from the state saying, uh, we owe you $50,000 from this capital project from 2007, 2008, we'll pay you when you get to it. And then you open up the next envelope from the state is, we overpaid you $20,000 in special education excess cost aids, we're gonna take that right now. Um, so rather than just say, hey, how about you owe us $30,000 later? Um, that's in essence what the Assembly and Senate are trying to do uh, with their proposals um, to allow you to adjust that accordingly. Uh, so that that would be a, a nice touch for us. It would be nice if they gave us the eight hundred and forty-five thousand dollars tomorrow as well. But I'm not <laughs> holding out any hope. Uh, one of the structural things everybody knows we have to do a building condition survey every five years: 2010, 2015. Next one's up 2020. I think this is a huge help for the state itself to stagger these, um, especially for the architectural and engineering firms that are are doing these for all the districts. Not as overwhelming. Uh, some proposals around financial flexibility. Assembly will allow districts to create a TRS reserve uh, capped at 10% of TRS salaries. Um, and then the Senate would allow you to just take the ERS reserve, make it one pension reserve uh, fund. Either way would be helpful. And around transportation, uh, Assembly would give, uh, right now we have no aid for any UPK transportation. Uh, they would allow aid for pre-K students. And the Senate is actually uh, part of the proposal would make stop arm cameras eligible for transportation aid, whereas the governors right now, districts would pay for it by whatever fines you're collected. So uh, the Senate would be a little bit more of an incentive for districts to, to make that move to the stop arm cameras. So that's where we're at. Uh, we got uh, about two weeks two and a half weeks before the due date. So uh, we'll see what actually comes through and happens as far as the state uh, budget is concerned. Any questions on? You don't anything? necessarily think there'll be a budget on time this year though, do you? I, or, you know, it seems you? like they're fighting a little bit more this year than they have in years past, uh, which, is, uh, which is an interesting scenario, mm -hmm. uh, considering all three branches are uh, the same political party. Right. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Okay, there's our state aid update. So let's jump into our instructional budget. This is everything uh, instructional that we do. Uh, I'm gonna focus on pupil services first uh, for 1920. Um, and what is pupil services? It's all of our psychologists, social workers, nursing services, what we pay for occupational education, uh, which is the CTE program through BOCES. Uh, the guidance uh, offices, attendance, and summer school. So why are we starting with the PPS? Because uh, it has the number one budget change for 1920. Um, so what is changing? Uh, right now, we have an additional 4.0 uh, FTE for district mental health support um, in this budget. Uh, very small increase uh, for CTE programs going up through BOCES. Uh, and the minimum wage impact 
uh, the health aids that are focusing in here. So those are the three things that are changing. But obviously, number one, I should have probably made it in bold because uh, this has been one of the district goals is to increase mental health support. I think we're comfortable uh, within this budget that we're gonna propose to add a 4.0 FTE for district mental health uh, moving forward, okay? So what do those numbers like look like? How does it shake out? Um, you know, salaries, you have the additional 4.0 FTE there, so you see that uh, budget line going up. Uh, the non-instructional salaries are going up 8%, but that's minimum wage, that's a lot, our health aides, uh, those student health aides, um, health office aides are all part of this budget, so you'll see that that's trending up because of that. And then a very a, a small BOCI services increase of about 1.5% um, for those CTE programs. Um, a very minor overall when you talk about 160 students that we have attending those programs between uh, the, the high schools. Um, so uh, a small year-to-year -year, uh, increase there. And you, you, if you notice the previous two years, uh, we've had no increases to the cost of those programs in 17, 18, or 18, 19. Just a follow-up. When we were into the BOCES, we did the BOCES tour uh, two weeks ago, so the CTE was around um, cosmetology. We walked through the construction area. We did culinary, um, <laughs> welding, precision manufacturing. I forget how many. Mechanics. Yep. Yeah. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> it was but all the, great. but those that that's what that cost is is for. Okay, uh, and then just as a comparison of how do we compare to um, keeping that theme going from the first workshop. Uh, where do we compare? Remember, when I'm pulling this data, it's still 2017 data uh, that the state has. Um, where are we? We're slightly above average. Uh, my next trivia question, why do you think we're, we're above average? What, what makes us different or unique, probably comparison to some of our um, Monroe One BOCES counterparts? We send the largest number of people to BOCES. Would they have effect? Hint, hint, it's in the title. In, in parentheses. <laughs> what do we have probably more of than anybody else? Guidance. Guidance. Because we have two because high schools two and high high schools. two middle schools. Yeah. Uh, so that makes us a little bit unique from mm -hmm. everybody else. So when you pull that information from the state in its entirety, we're going to skew uh, higher than, sure. than our, sure. our, our counterparts. Uh, so, but that, you know, you know, it's not like we're, uh, we're right there, uh, just slightly above we're average. Not a. <laughs> um, so just put that as a benchmark. Next up is the curriculum budget. We have uh, some changes there uh, for next year. Number one is the, the, the largest part of the curriculum budget is a lot of our PD, uh, and we do a lot of our PD through BOCES. And to be able to do that, uh, there's a base service, it's called Model Schools and School Improvement. Uh, and that is increasing beyond our normal percent increases. Uh, I think uh, the model changed a little bit. Um, they're adding more to it. So we're the largest part, we need to pay more. So you'll see our BOCES costs going up because of that. Uh, we're also increasing our participation in some shared professional development. So you'll see that as part of this budget and the budget numbers. Um, some of the salary increases as well. Uh, we're realigning TOSAs into this line out of the special education budget. It makes more sense. They're doing more uh, curriculum development. Um, so we wanted to align that into an area where it, it, it should be reasonably. Um, so that's why you'll see a significant increase. And then additionally, um, the FLIP PD model, uh, we're one and a half a year of expenditure analysis. So there's a small increase um, for salaries as part of that flip model um, going forward. So as you look, you see uh, the variance is, is large, but that's, that's 3.0 FTE moving into that proposed budget. Uh, you will see that come down. You'll see the increase be much smaller in special education because of that. But this is also a much smaller overall budget number. Uh, so it has a greater impact. Uh, some savings on the instructional salaries um, from retirements, uh, so we're realizing some breakage there. 
And then you see the 9% increase for the BOCES services. Um, 25, in the grand scheme of things, it's a $25,000 increase. Skews when you look at the percent change from year to year. That's been flat for 17, 18, 18, 19, but 19, 20, a, a $25,000 increase. Um, it just due to those two uh, services we're purchasing. Okay, any questions there? Now I want to show you the comparison for this. You know, I, I don't feel that this data is as, um, you know, accurate when I look out what's reported to the state because not everybody has to use this code. We use it for our own internal, so we report it out to the state as such, but a lot of other districts could just wrap this up into an instructional uh, budget and not specify it's for curriculum. So um, I think we do a good job supporting Mr. Neenan and his program uh, overall uh, as part of the budget. So, um, but this is just, you know, to, to continue that theme, but I really don't think everyone utilizes these reporting codes to the state um, as consistently, um, so it, it could it could vary a little bit. I think based on that. Any questions so far? Okay. So let's take get into the instructional uh, meat and potatoes of the budget. Some changes this year. Uh, many of you are familiar with the ESSA requirements and how allocating things per building. Uh, last year, the state took that and ran with it and required districts to report um, at a per pupil, per building basis. Uh, the only Monroe County district that had to report in the first round last year was Brockport. Uh, they were the first ones to go through it. The rest of us all have to do it this year. Uh, so, you know, as we are gearing up for that, how could we adapt our budget practices um, around instruction, around the building to kind of align with that thought process of um, allocating funds per building. And this is something I'm, I've been looking at since, we've, since I've joined the district. Um, you know, we've always had a zero-based, needs-based budget and gone uh, to all the budget builders and said, well, okay, what do you need for your program? What do you need, what, you know, start at zero and work your way up. Uh, so that often doesn't take into account swings in enrollment uh, when you look at it from that perspective. So we could have you know, some, some variances based on that. So looking back at past data and history of what, it, what do we actually spend comparing that to enrollment buildings, uh, we looked at per pupil for the buildings and library um, to do, to implement for 1920. Uh, so you'll see that as part of this instructional budget. They were, I guess, the easiest and simplest to formula and codify. Uh, department budgets is a little harder, I think. You know, the science, the social studies uh, to do on a, on a per pupil because there's wide variances uh, between needs. The, the science needs at the secondary level are, are a little different than the elementary level. So trying to put our per pupil around that, I think is something we kind of work to. But for buildings and library, it, it was fairly um, more of a simple process. So out of that, what are you gonna see? Um, there was more money available to the buildings uh, when we took a look at that, and we can get into the details uh, as we look in the buildings. But you're gonna see uh, equipment increases. A lot of the buildings uh, want to convert to a flexible furniture district-wide, which I think you've seen on your learning walks uh, throughout the district. Um, some repurposed furniture um, with different setups. So there's money there uh, to increase that. And uh, a lot of additional monies for supplies. Remember, the cutoff for us for supplies is $500. So anything below $500 is a supply. Anything above $500 is equipment. So a lot of the chairs at the elementary level don't need equipment money. Um, they could be purchased through supply money. So you'll see some additional funds uh, for supplies. Salaries, you're looking at smaller increases due to breakage from 17, 18 uh, year, the, that uh, retirement year. Uh, but you know, non-instructional is really being driven by minimum wage or aids. So you'll see that much higher than uh, the increases on the instructional side. 
Uh, BOCES, this will be a trend, um, not to blame them for anything, um, but you'll see the trend as we get into this instructional budget. We spend a significant amount on instructional software and the support and all our student management systems, all the operating systems. Those costs for software are, are increasing well beyond what we would say your CPI or your 3%. We're seeing eight, nine, 10% software cost increases on a lot of the things we do. Um, I, so, and then you'll see with textbooks, uh, you'll see a reduction in textbooks, uh, what we're allocating, um, because we're us utilizing more digital resources as part of our program. Um, so maybe they don't align as quickly, like digital resources, textbooks, digital resources, mm, textbooks. Um, so you'll see some reductions there. So that's you know kind of the general themes of where we're heading with the instructional budget. Uh, pointing out you know the equipment and supplies, uh, the buildings that received greater allocations, that's where they utilize their money as part of this instructional budget. Um, their overall, uh, they uh, are large increases, but in the overall piece of the pie, really uh, not that large of an increase when you're looking at 11 different buildings. And I'll break those down a little bit more for you. Uh, so. You see the textbook decrease. Overall, the instructional budget, 2.6% increase over 18-19, uh, okay? So there's the numbers. And then, of course, our fun comparison to our Monroe One counterparts. We are slightly above average. I do feel much better about this data poll because this is all the instructional numbers coming together. Um, so. If somebody doesn't use curriculum, they got to put it here. So it's all being pulled together of where we are. And you can see as a percentage of budget, most of the districts on the east side are relatively close to what we spend on instructional support and on instruction um, for our students. Okay? And this is everything. This is from principals to crayons. Um, you know, anything we use for instruction. So let's talk a little bit more. We'll break down how we came about that per pupil allocation because that's, that's a new change this year compared to the zero-based. Um, so like I said, the ESSA and SED requirements really started driving this conversation last, year, last summer uh, when we were looking at this and looking at the methodology. So it did a lot of historical analysis of our building budgets. And we we're looking around 175 per student that we spent at the elementary level. Uh, 185 for middle and 225 for high school um, and then we you know I, I, I did a lot of look at county schools outside of New York State that do this as an everyday practice to get a feel because they've been doing this because you just you know when you're in Fulton County in Atlanta you know and it's a two billion dollar budget school XYZ out there you know, how many kids you got, here's your per pupil allocation. So I try to do as much research on the methodology, and it came uh, that everybody also um, puts additional allocations for uh, additional cost outliers. So if your building has uh, special education classes, uh, there would be a factor increase for that because it's uh, additional resources needed for the building. If you had an ENL program, there'd be another factor for, for that. Uh, and the most popular one that I, I, I gathered from across uh, that a lot of the schools use is a uh, multiplier for free and reduced lunch rates. And quite often, so what we did was if your free and reduced lunch rate for your building was above the district average, you also got an additional um, allocation beyond your base amounts. So we looked at about 10 years worth of our spending data and to come up with these amounts, something that was fair and equitable and we could utilize for all of our buildings um, going forward. It will also help with those reporting requirements. Okay. So you see, um, this is three years of data of where the building budgets are of all 11 schools, 17, 18. Um, what we found through the process was that secondary and by secondary, I mean middle and high schools were underfunded uh, relative to the, to the elementaries through the zero-based budget process. Um, so they're actually the big winners 
of this, of this new methodology, especially the middle schools. Um, some of the middle schools' budgets were, um, you know, I think grossly, no, I won't say grossly, um, that might be too strong, but they were underfunded um, when we took a look at this. So uh, a lot of that increase you just saw on the instructional side for supplies and equipment, you'll see it's going to Spry and Willink um, with their programming. Okay. Is there a big difference in enrollment in our elementary? Well, I think when, that was what it came to when you benchmark again as enrollment as a factor mm -hmm. um, the way we did it before the way it, they were get, the elementaries were getting a much larger chunk right. of right. the building budgets because per they their all enrollment got the same because they all yeah. relatively landed the same yeah. um, and you know a school that had 600 kids on a needs based wasn't that much more than a, a school with five, 550 but when you put a formula to it it really separates so then when you put 999 kids from Willink and 1,010 from Spry, yeah. you know, into that allocation. And part of the reasoning and logic behind the cost ex escalation is because of the specificity. Uh, and you'll see this when we talk library, it actually works in reverse. So, you know, the costs are going up because the courses are changing um, for each level. There's more, there's the more specific needs for the curriculum Mm -hmm. uh, will increase as the middle and the high school go up. So that's where we saw those spending differences. But the middle schools are the big winners okay. um, in, the, in the per pupil allocation. Mm -hmm. So library, we did the same thing, but you notice when we track 10 years worth of uh, the spending history of what we, we've been doing, it's the elementaries that get more per person because their books are actually costing more than that paperback novel that might be on the shelf at the middle or high school. That picture book is worth a lot more, uh, at the, you know, for the primary grade. So you, if the exact opposite happened uh, when we look at the per pupil allocation for uh, library going forward. Uh, the largest jump for the library um, you'll see is, <clears throat> excuse me, is the BOCES services. Um, what we pay for the the databases, um, that that software. Um, a huge cost driver um, for a multitude of the search engines and, and, and those items. Uh, you see a huge jump. Um, but it's, you know, we've seen slight increases. 17, 18 to 18, 19 was 10. This year it was 25. So, Brian, we just pay an annual fee. It's correct. Like we don't buy the software. We don't buy it. No, nope, you're, you're correct. Yep. Okay, thank you. Annual licensing fee. Any questions on, on that per pupil is a big is a big change. I think it took a few extra meetings with our budget uh, stakeholders to, to work through that and, and, and go through the formula and where we were coming from. But it'll make reporting much easier because um, it's you know when we go to do that with the state, everybody's a per pupil. This is what this is what we're doing. This is why this school has this much. This is why this school has this much. Uh, sorry, another question. No, no. Um, so, once this initial investment of time is spent this year, say, um, next year you won't have to spend any more time for this additional reporting. I, I'd like to do the reporting first <laughs> um, to see how, because they actually, um, they're in the middle of changing what they did the first round. Okay. Um, so, they're, Already. I, I went to a meeting back in, <laughs> November, um, the, a regional meeting, uh, and we were able to give feedback. Like, what do you want us to do with okay. this? And so they were take they were doing kind of a listening session. I think they were they were doing one in Buffalo. They did one in Syracuse. They were going downstate, uh, and it was people from SED. So you know, how do you want us? To, how do we per pupil or how do we split up build? How do we put the debt service per building? How do we do benefits per building? How do we do workers' comp per building? Mm -hmm. um, you know, are you going to narrow it? So, you know, still working through our that reporting won't be due until July, um, probably more likely August, and then another round of it in December per, yeah. of next year for this year. Okay. So. Well, my point was around the unfunded mandate part of oh. this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so once you get it down pat. Then it won't right. be any then, Yeah, we tr I just try to come up with the right system okay. to make it as easy as possible for the reporting. Okay. 
Thank you. Thanks. So this is one of those unfunded mandates we really can't complain about. I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So moving on to uh, the special education budget for 1920. Um, it was a great presentation uh, last meeting about the OWL program and, uh, and the positive impact that that's had for our students. So just want to go back, give you three years of history of where, what are our huge special education drivers. I remember I went, probably about three, four years ago, there was a workshop where we went into greater detail on some of the BOCES placements and the private placements and worked about, about that program. So I just wanted to refresh, you know, where have we been with, the, with these placements and because they're a huge driver of our costs. So in 1718, we were at 58 students in BOCES programs. And then this year, we're at 50, this is the first year that the OWL program started, so we see that dip because we're doing it in-house. Uh, but for next year, 1920, um, we've, we're, we're moving back up uh, with the out-of-district BOCES placements. Uh, and you'll see that in the numbers. Um, and then the private placements, of, which is your Norman Howard, your Crestwood, your Helpern, uh, your Mary Cariola placements, those have stayed, you know, relatively stable, I'll say, and compared to the BOCES placements uh, that have ebbed and flowed a little bit more uh, over, the, over the years. So that's, you know, just a fundamental, when we talk cost drivers for special education, this is, this is it right here. So where's our special education budget? You notice, the, the, you know, a little over a 2% um, on the salaries because we're moving some of those uh, salaries out and put them into curriculum, so below. So the amount that it increased would be much less because uh, we shifted those over. Uh, we have probably 100 aides uh, in the district uh, working with students with disabilities, minimum wage uh, on the non-instructional. I mean, I, I think you've heard me say that enough, uh, but the, for the next couple budget cycles till we get to 1250, uh, I'll be saying that every year. You're going to see those uh, seven to nine percent increases on those uh, support service salaries uh, as we as they change. Uh, you'll see a reduction in supplies, and then you see those what those ten placements um, will do to the BOCES budget for next year uh, that we're adding um, adding to the budget uh, for special education. A total number of people in the district that are being moved because of the minimum wage, not just our aides, but our summer employees and, you know, everybody. If you count all the part-time, like, lifeguards, yep. and you, I'll, I'll show that later on as well, uh, it's just about 400 um, overall. Uh, we do hire a lot of kids yeah. um, for those programs for summer. I mean, Buildings and Grounds hires uh, anywhere between 35 and 50 mm -hmm. on a good year, uh, 50 kids to work uh, the summer that are all on the minimum wage, or um, you know the ones that are returning yeah. and have proven themselves, we give them a little bit more, like a, a welcome back, here's above, you know, mm -hmm. not that much above because they're already, they're already <laughs> yeah. getting an 8% yeah. uh, that <laughs> January. Um, so, you know, if we have, last it was about 450, um, total staff members that were impacted, um, mm -hmm. mostly in the aids and food service and mm -hmm. um, bus monitors, so. Okay. okay. So how do we compare um, to Monroe One BOCES as a percentage of the budget? Uh, overall, we still are fairly, we're pretty efficient. Um, we are the lowest um, overall percent of the budget of special education costs. And I will say this, um, does not include the savings. If you go back right here, you see where uh, our BOCE services was in 1718 to 1819. The start of the OWL program saved us a tremendous amount of money. That is not getting picked up in here yet because uh, that data has not been officially reported to the state. Uh, so even before we had a precipitous cost drop in our numbers, uh, we're, we're still a year away from reporting that data to be picked up in these comparisons. 
So instructional technology, uh, we'll spend a, a little bit more time. I have a fun present for everybody. Here is the latest Chromebook we are um, in, Brian, in, before you go on, yeah. could, could you go back, I, and I apologize if I missed, but uh, back a couple slides, the special ed changes going from 50 to 60 next year. Yes. Well, I'm sorry if I missed, well, how come it's going up? Movement of students in, in the district. Uh, a large part of that is kids that have moved in this year. Oh, okay, so we've had an influx of kids. Correct. Out. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Yes. Or maybe that there are students that are already in special classes on campus that may not be the best place for them, and so now they're going to be off campus for yep. both seats placement. Mm -hmm. So instructional technology, pass that around because you know it's time flies. Uh, this summer will be the first refresh of the one-to-one -one student Chromebooks. This is the new student Chromebook. Uh, many of you might remember you yes. you, were, you had Chromebooks. It's a lot, uh, this one is a lot sleeker. Um, it actually is also a tablet. Yeah. So uh, a touchscreen. A touch screen. Oh, yeah. Um, so it, it could do both. <clears throat> Um, so we're real excited. Um, that's the new model. Um, so you'll see some extra funds uh, for professional development around how to use the new Chromebook this summer uh, as part of this budget. And I put a link in here for everyone, uh, just how we do the lease program uh, through BOCES as a refresher. Um, you know, it's on a cycle, we do three years. Um, right here is year four. Just to kind of show you where we're at. Um, we actually spend after aid now with the full four years uh, for 1920. We spend less than we did four years ago because uh, in true um, gross funds. So we're getting more for our for our money. So I just wanted to, to you know show you that worksheet because that that was the precipitous we did a lot of work with that three years ago when presenting that budget for how do the numbers make sense um, and that shows you we buy it this year get the aid next year that aid funds the second years of purchases then we have the aid for two years of purchases that funds the third year and then it just continues that cycle so it's a self-contained um, which was a huge cultural and financial change from how we used to do it would be okay we have x amount of dollars left what do you guys need so one building would get ipads one buildings would get a chromebook they would get laptops and we were all over and not consistent with our programming so this um, financial uh, helps that solve that issue so we're consistent across the board uh, small increase to supplies for av tv at the secondary buildings um, a huge shout out to our AV TV people at the four secondary buildings. I don't, I don't think there's a day off in one of our auditoriums um, 12 months a year, especially on weekends. Um, that equipment uh, takes a beating. Uh, there, we're, you know, we, we're open to the community for a lot of those events, so uh, increases there to, to help replace some equipment for next year. Um, and then, obviously, Software network costs are trending extremely high, uh, especially all of our operating software. Um, you know, think of things like <coughs> Adobe. Uh, those type of platform are, are extremely uh, expensive, uh, but we need them. I mean, we can't function in today's age without them. So we're seeing some high trend costs there, especially around our fiber as well. So, so Mr. Dean. I just wanted to add to the Chromebook piece. Okay. Certainly something else I know that uh, the board would love to hear is that we test drove those with the kids. And so we had a group of kids that test drove the, the new, um, you know, the tablet style um, screens and they loved them. They absolutely loved them. So they gave us feedback before we made that decision. And I think that was just a great way to go. You know, certainly our Thai kids and our WTI kids were all involved in that. So. That was great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So when you take a look at the numbers, some of the things I talked through, you know, we have some extra PD 
in our salaries to help assist with that Chromebook rollout uh, and because it, it does have some new functions and features which is different um, and then you see the increase for supplies um, you know looks like a large rate change but it's only ten thousand dollars more for our AV TV Quick question the, sure. the fiber optics um, yes is that in the BOCI services line it is okay correct yep so the 8% overall on the BOCI service line, that's all of our software and fiber. Um, every we, every non-HR or business piece of software we do goes through that, that BOCI's line. And how much are they, how much are those rates going up a year? Uh, it varies by, um, by program. Some are 12, some are six. So it's, it's right around an 8% um, for all of them. Okay, maybe I'm not understanding what fiber optics is then. <laughs> so isn't that just like a internet fee? Correct, yes, so, that is part of that, but our software is also, oh, software, okay. it's also so, part of that, okay. yes. So internet. The month-to-month -month fee for internet, month, yes. About how much does that go up? That is, closer to the uh, lower end it's like a five percent um, compared a lot yeah comparative to the um, we're also running a lot more on our network oh. and that's part of it the cameras that so we did the through the capacity that we're using correct okay. the, the camera system uh, the new boilers are all on network right. um, so we're oh. we're putting more systems on to the network so we're we're using our traffic is up okay now, now I'm getting it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for bringing that. I apologize I wasn't uh, more specific with that. It's okay. <laughs> so I, obviously, I don't know how little I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so where we look in, at, in comparison to Monroe One BOCES, we're a one-to-one -one district. So obviously I would expect us to be higher than a lot of the other districts. Um, also, this is one of those ones where maybe not every district will we'll put their costs into an instructional technology. Um, all of our people that work for technology are part of our instructional technology team, so they're all there. Other districts might not also share that same philosophical view of budgeting um, that we do. Okay, uh, athletics and co-curricular. Uh, a couple things. Uh, replenishment of budget lines that were reduced last year. Uh, Try to take a look at doing this as a per pupil as well. I just couldn't, I, I, I felt like it would be forced, um, especially when it's just at, uh, when we do this, it's four buildings at the secondary level. Um, so you'll see some increases for supplies and uniforms uh, for next year. Uh, and increased costs for rentals going up. You'll see that as well, um, especially around uh, bowling for PE, um, what we what we pay those costs um, get transferred right back to us. Uh, also for skating at the rink across the street from Thomas, um, I need, we we have that as part of our PE program. Uh, so when those fees go up, we're paying more. So you'll see that. Uh, also software costs again, uh, the minimal increase uh, through BOCES, but still comparative. On the, on the budget side, we're trying to do more with our software, uh, making things easier, uh, like the family ID, when you go to register for uh, athletics, doing that online, uh, replacing, making it a more user-friendly and easier process, but those software costs have costs. Uh, and then salaries, we're just uh, doing a projection because th that's open for negotiations right now. Uh, not looking to add or cut any kind of uh, interscholastic programs so uh, really it's just a, a projection based on historical what where we could land uh, with a with a new matrix um, as part of this budget so overall um, you know you're seeing a, a little less than five percent but most of that is from the supplies going up uh, the BOCI services and increase in the contractual rates uh, as well as in equipment uh, costs going up, uh, mainly around equipment repair and conditioning, um, those costs um, going up, the extra $1,500 you see there. 
because uh, that goes to maintaining our uh, fitness centers. Uh, so you see some of the costs going up there. Now, where are we in comparison for athletics for Monroe One BOCES? Uh, we are uh, below the average slightly, uh, which is uh, telling because we have two high schools and two middle schools uh, in twice uh, the sports programs of other schools. Um, so uh, to be under was, you know, when I run the data was actually kind of surprising uh, in comparison, but you know, this is 2017 numbers as well. Any questions on the athletics piece? Okay. So community education and recreation, the proposed 1920 budget. Uh, some changes there, what's happening. Uh, you know, minimum wage have a huge impact on our program because it's dollars out for dollars in. Um, so as costs go up, unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> relay that over to the cost of the programs that we're running. Uh, try to keep it as uh, minimal as possible to uh, stay competitive and present a good product to the community, especially around aquatics, uh, which is our largest program until September 1 uh, when it comes to community education. Uh, not unlike a lot of other places, it, it, it's tough finding lifeguards uh, to run all of our, all the programming that we're doing at the pools. Um, we're finding it very difficult um, to, you know, we're used to getting 15, 16 year old kids to, that will take it, but you know, we have to make those jobs look attractive to them because um, we're competing with the other employers. Um, you know, we don't give a cool discount like the mall does. We just, we give you a fun lifeguard t-shirt and some shorts and a bathing suit occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't give you 50% off at Abercrombie. Uh, so that's what we're competing against. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, we're trying, it, that's tough balance uh, to, uh, to get kids into the program. Uh, you'll see some increase in supplies and contractuals for a lot of our uh, uniform price increases in the service contracts. Uh, and you will see more money for equipment uh, in 1920. Um, surprisingly, WAC is approaching 20, the 20 years old. Um, so we're trying to develop a systemic approach to replacing some of the equipment uh, that is utilized over there um, that needs to, to be replaced. Uh, we don't want to rely on capital projects to fix or replace everything. So we, we want to try to get an approach where, okay, um, where can we go every year and, and create a cycle of this is what we invest um, to try to uh, stave off that, yeah, we need a, a capital project to, to do some stuff uh, to the pool over there. Uh, and like I said, we still want to run quality programs for the community, and that requires uh, quality equipment and materials. Um, for a lot of our programs. So you see the salaries uh, obviously uh, jumping up, but we have increases everywhere. Overall, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge uh, increase. Uh, it's just an increase for this, this budget, this impact. Uh, overall, though, is, is minimal. Um, you'll see um, see that here with just about a nine and a half percent increase most of that being salaries and some equipment replacement for the aquatic center program a lot of we need to replace the lifts um, to get a little bit more uh, specificity the lift systems to utilize in both pools are um, just about shot so the, those need a, a replacement yes mm -hmm. yep Okay, so what does our first, our first budget quote look like when we combine uh, both workshop presentations? Uh, a 3.1% increase, $177,649,874 uh, for just about a $5.3 million increase over 1819. So we have a small gap, 342752 based on the revenue we pre presented at the first workshop. Based on all the expenditures we have, we have a, uh, a budget deficit, um, per se. Uh, I think, just like I presented last year, this budget deficit is well within the range of what we could expect from the state by April 1st. Um, so 
uh, we'll see what actually happens. But I think we're well within uh, reason that these numbers will work when we go uh, and get our state budget. So what's remaining of the budget process? Um, so April 1st is the state budget is due. How do we close the deficit? Hopefully it's answered on that day. Um, so April 11th, WEPS Report of Education is the final budget presentation and adoption. So between the 1st and the 11th is a very busy time in my life. Um, we'll be working through those numbers that the state finalizes. And then uh, on April 12th, the property tax report card is due uh, the day after the board adopts the budget. April 29th, just so it's in uh, the back of your head in case something doesn't work out from the state or something happens, April 29th this year is the last possible day to adopt a budget. Um, I think we had to do that two years ago when they did not release any state aid runs until the very last minute we, we had a, a longer conversation. Um, and so we, we backed up the original date to uh, something closer to the last possible date. Uh, May 9th is our budget hearing, and then May 21st is budget vote day. So just to review uh, what we're looking at, uh, new positions for new mental health providers, uh, moving to a per pupil for our building budgets, uh, special education, additional placements, increasing the overall budget, uh, minimum wage continues to impact our support staff, uh, software and network costs are increasing uh, based on vendor and BOCES pricing. And then athletics just looking at a, a replenishment of their supply lines uh, and increases for contractual expenses or the, or the overarching themes, I think, uh, to, re, to uh, highlight for tonight's budget presentation. Open the floor to questions. Any pleased that you know we have a way to maintain all our good quality programs um, do you have a little list that if we don't get the the uh, extra money that we're expecting from the state of what we would do right do so I'm always re look you know this it gives me more time to look at those state formulas yeah and do better projections um, you know especially the ones on enrollment I you know I always like to the last minute because like I've stated, when it comes to the excess cost aids and the private excess cost aids, you know, it's a snapshot in time. Mm -hmm. So on March 29th, looking at, all right, here's our enrollment, run it through the formulas. This is what I expect for next year. What we budget for, the state is not required to give us because if five kids move out, you know, yeah. oh, I'm, we've now, five kids move out in May, we've now shorted ourselves yeah. that money because the state's not going to give it to us mm -hmm. um, as we were planning on. So just trying to drive into the numbers there more, uh, you know, there's always something we pick up uh, between this workshop and that final budget adoption where we see, uh, where we can find those numbers a little, sharpen the pencil a little bit more. Anyone else? Any other questions? Um, I don't. I don't have a question, but I'd just like to make a comment. comment. In the years we've we've had, I, I would say, multiple complaints about the amount of money we spent on athletics and co-curricular, and I just have to say that, you know, the bang for the buck that we get for less than one and a half percent of our budget is just significant. I mean, how many kids are pos or students are positively impacted by? all the activities that we provide it's just it really is a big bang for our buck and so I'm very pleased and it's I mean I, it's 1.35 not even one and a half percent so it's it, it's a really good spend for us I think it's a real good investment in our students and 70% of our kids 70% yeah mm. I mean and that's probably, huge yeah wow that's wonderful <clears throat> Oh, yeah. yeah. And there's another 20% of our kids that right. don't do athletics, but they do marching band yeah. or, or drama or art club right. or math Olympiad or science Olympiad or yeah. whatever yeah. it is, robotics. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it is. A, cool. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what? If you, next time you do the presentation, include that 70%. Sure. Because yeah. that's really a good. Go pull that data. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you very much, Brian, for all your all your continued effort and the comparisons. Um, certainly, considering we have four secondary schools and we still oh fall below Amazing. the average in many of the spending categories. So, thank you for the diligence behind that. It's group effort. <laughs> In, in closing, I'd like to acknowledge the passing of Tom Anthony Genovola, March 17th, um, principal at Clem North for 16 years. Certainly the impact that he's had within this district and to all the students and families within the Clem North family, um, would just like to extend our sincerest condolences to his family. Thank you. And with that, can we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make that motion. And second by Jan, all in favor. Thank you, have a good evening.